Ladies and gentlemen, would you please take your seats? Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. In the event of an emergency, would you please vacate the building by the nearest exit, following the signs as indicated. Thank you. women were raped during the Rwanda genocide, as many as 64,000 in Sierra Leone, and over 40,000 in the Bosnia and Herzegovina War, 4,500 in a single province of the Democratic Republic of the Congo in just six months, and every day hundreds of women are raped in Darfur. These are not the random acts of individual soldiers. They are military tactics used to shame and demoralize women, tear communities apart, and control populations. Many women and girls suffer torture and mutilation in front of their families. Others are impregnated to shift the ethnic balance of territories. All face the physical, emotional, and social consequences of rape. She could be your mother, your sister, your daughter. It is perhaps more dangerous to be a woman and a soldier in an armed conflict. Those responsible for sexual violence must be held accountable. Wars are being fought on the bodies of women and children. La violence sexuelle est la monstruosité de notre siècle. This must end, but we need your help. Together, we can make a difference by helping to change the attitudes that perpetuate violence against women, by changing the laws and policies that provide impunity for offenders, by uniting in defiance to end this crime against humanity. Together, we will stop rape. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Foreign Secretary, William Hague. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and thank you all for being here today for this unprecedented event. It is hugely inspiring to see more than 123 countries represented in this room today, many UN agencies and international organizations, faith leaders, military leaders, lawyers, Nobel laureates, dedicated activists, and courageous survivors. This is truly 
a summit like no other. Just a few minutes walk away are a multitude of exhibitions, stalls, performances and events that bring home the horrors of sexual violence and the unsung heroism of those who have suffered this appalling crime and yet gone on to rebuild their lives and their communities. After two days of civil society events and expert discussions, I am more convinced than ever that all of our governments must dramatically increase their efforts to eradicate these appalling crimes. First, because this is a matter of our common humanity, I defy anyone to read the testimony of survivors, to hear their voices, to meet them in person, and not to be moved to take up this struggle. Sexual violence is a uniquely destructive act and tactic of war, and an outrage to all morality. Survivors must not only go through the trauma of the attack, too often they then face rejection by their families and sometimes reprisals from their communities. They must see their attackers every day walking free on the street or holding positions of authority while they are made to feel ashamed and stay silent. This is not a situation that our consciences can tolerate. And I firmly believe that as foreign ministers from all over the world, we must not just fight the flames of one crisis after another in our daily work. We must also work positively to improve the condition of humanity. And it is not only our values that are at stake. Sexual violence in conflict undermines international peace and security. And this is the second reason we must act now to tackle this scourge. War zone rape not only devastates individual lives, it divides communities, making the wounds of war that much harder to heal. It holds back development, drives refugee flows, and undermines regional stability. In a world where events in one country can rapidly affect not just neighboring countries, but others thousands of miles away, this is an issue that none of us can ignore. Third, if we don't tackle these issues now, they will only get worse. By undermining reconciliation, deepening grievances, and devastating communities, sexual violence fuels a cycle of conflict and more abuses that is immensely destructive. We are all here because we have made a commitment to end sexual violence in conflict. But now the time has come for practical action. We must all work together to shatter the culture of impunity for sexual violence in conflict at every level. We must ensure the right laws are in place to hold the perpetrators of these crimes to account, whether they directly committed rape or they commanded it. And we must ensure that all those working to document these crimes have the understanding and the skills to investigate them while protecting survivors, which is why yesterday we launched the International Protocol on the Documentation and Investigation of Sexual Violence in Conflict. Above all, as governments, we must send the message internationally and at home that rape in war is not some lesser crime. It is an atrocity of the first order, and there must be no safe haven for perpetrators anywhere in the world. I hope governments, international organizations, and the civil society organizations here today can all use the international protocol in training, in policies, and in practice to help bring the full weight of the law down on this terrible abuse. But in addition to making use of every legal avenue, we must also do more to reduce the immediate danger to women and men in conflict zones around the world. I hope all countries can give preventing sexual violence the weight it deserves in their military doctrines and train soldiers and peacekeepers to apply simple steps that can dramatically reduce the risks of attacks and to respond appropriately to sexual violence when it does occur. Survivors need more support, both in emergencies and after conflict has subsided. Mobilizing this support is another of our key objectives at this summit. The UK has this week committed another five million pounds to improving services for survivors of sexual violence in conflict worldwide 
and we've announced another £1 million in support for the International Criminal Court's Trust Fund for Victims. I hope other governments will be able to do more to help survivors to gain access to the support they desperately need and help the human rights defenders who campaign to bring justice. And finally, I hope we can work together through this summit to produce a global shift in attitudes. We must debunk the myth that rape in war is somehow inevitable. We must demonstrate the scale of the problem, acknowledge its impact on every continent and on men and boys as well as women and girls. We must transform world opinion and ingrain an opposition to this crime so deep that it will strike fear into the heart of any would-be perpetrator. Our goal is not to impose solutions, it is to help countries that are themselves dealing with this crime and its legacy, like the Democratic Republic of Congo and Somalia, for instance, who will be discussing their work later today. Our aim is to work in partnership with the UN, supporting Special Representative on Sexual Violence and Conflict, Zainab Bangura, and UN Action Against Sexual Violence and Conflict, so that they can maintain and intensify their invaluable efforts and it is to work with regional organizations, from the Organization of American States to the African Union, the OSCE, the European Union, so that no corner of the globe is left untouched by our campaign. We have a unique opportunity over the next 24 hours to intensify and extend our efforts to deal with this issue. It may take many years to reach our goals, but every concrete step we take helps to erode the culture of impunity, to relieve survivors of their stigma and suffering, and to deter future perpetrators. All of us gathered in this room, acting together, can make an enormous difference, and we must make sure it is lasting and profound. The action that needs to be taken is the responsibility of governments. But as you know, this summit is not just about governments. This brings together campaigners, survivors, sufferers who have the knowledge, the passion, often the quiet dignity that can teach important lessons to us all. So let us be mindful of all of them and also draw inspiration from the activists and artists in the fringe and around the world, drawing attention to these issues, changing attitudes and creating international momentum. And so I'm delighted now to introduce the winner of the British Embassy in Mexico's video competition, a short film by Belem Ramirez, who is here as part of the youth delegation. Thank you very much indeed. Do you know that more than 2,000 files are shared every minute by the internet? Yes, I know. How old are my selfies? What was that? It was a message from my friend. Well, ignore it. He wanted us to take a stand against something. Well, ignore it too. What does that mean? Well, sometimes sex as a cell, this use as a war weapon. That's horrible. Someone should do something about it. It's easier to ignore it. But is the offender near from here? Why is not our business? Isn't it? Ignore it. How can I ignore it? Just do it. They are girls like me. Mm, they are not like you. Yes, they are like me. Just ignore it. We can do anything about it. Yes, we can. We can stop ignoring it. We can take a stand against sexual violence. We can speak out. Together we can do it. It's time to stop ignoring it. It's time to act. Well, it's certainly time to act. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the co-host of the summit and one of the great inspirations for this campaign, uh, the special envoy of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Angelina Jolie. Mm -hmm. I have heard it asked this week, why this issue? Why now? Why in a world of so many problems, 
Are we focusing on this one? Why does it matter? Anyone who has met survivors and heard their stories knows that answer. We are here for the nine-year-old girl in Uganda, kidnapped and forced into sexual slavery. We are here for the man in Bosnia, years after rape, still stigmatized, unable to earn enough money to buy bread for his family. We are here for all the forgotten, hidden survivors who have been made to feel ashamed or been abandoned, and for the children of rape. We want the whole world to hear their stories and understand that this injustice cannot be tolerated, and that sorrow and compassion are not enough. As one woman told me yesterday, we've had enough of words. We want action. Many brave men and women have been fighting to protect victims of war zone rape for years, and many of them are here with us today. But we, as an international community, have never done enough to stop this abuse. And we do the survivors a disservice when they know we are aware, but do nothing to hold the perpetrators accountable. Our outrage does not help the woman who walks into her attacker on the street, free as a bird, free to abuse others, because of this global culture of impunity. And today, we have an opportunity to begin to change that. So my plea to you today is to see both the individuals who have suffered and the bigger picture. To think what we could each do as individuals and what we would do to prevent those we love from suffering and apply that protective instinct to the world's most vulnerable people. And to remember looking at the sweep of history, that we do have the power to eradicate injustice with political will and determination. These crimes of sexual violence are bigger than any one conflict or national interest. And for all the things that we struggle to agree upon as nations, the abhorrence of rape cannot be one of them. So I ask all the governments here today to move from condemnation to action, to be ready to change and improve your laws so they offer proper protections, to write the prevention of sexual violence into the training of your militaries and police forces, to support and implement the new international protocol, to drive up the number of prosecutions, and to fund the UN efforts and NGO projects that work with survivors to heal them emotionally and help them, help them to gain support and justice. War zone rape is a preventable crime. So our response must never again be that these things simply happen. It can never be that peace is more important than justice or that money is in short supply, or that there are other priorities. I have heard some people say that we have set ourselves an impossible task. But the greater the problem, the greater our determination should be. Look around you. Look at how many of us are here, at all the countries represented, and think of what we could accomplish together. Think of what difference we would make if we apply all the lessons learned at this summit and bring to bear all your influence and expertise. Think of what that would mean for millions of people. I am hopeful that we can unite on this issue. And I thank all the governments that have taken a stand by supporting our declaration and coming to London. This summit is a model for a new way of working together. And this single issue for us is now a center point. It is just the beginning. There are many crimes, abuses in all forms, that we must confront together. But let us begin here. And let us expand from here. Thank you.
صار يزوجني الابن عمي حتى بالغصب بقيت ويا الولا الشهر بس هاد حلال هاد الشهر كان حياتي مثل الموت يعني الدرب ولاتل كان هيك الحياة اللي جيت عن سأل اللي حسر انه ما نقتل Living under the shadow of a brutal civil war. They have seen and survived many horrors and have come to these sprawling, squalid UN camps because at least here they're safe. I met Rebecca, who's 20 years old, the wife of a Dinka, pro government soldier, pregnant with his child. She was captured by Nua rebels when they took Bentiu City. <laughs> She told me she was beaten with the butt of a gun, grabbed by two soldiers and then raped. Why did they rape you? It was because she was Dinka, because her president had killed Nuas. They wanted her Dinka baby to die. What we found here has happened across South Sudan, to Dinka and Nua alike. The UN reports rape and gang rape, women abducted by soldiers and kept as sexual slaves, atrocities and mass killings. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Under Secretary General and Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General for Sexual Violence in Conflict, Zainab Hawa Bangura. Good morning. I wish to thank the United Kingdom, especially Foreign Secretary William A. and Special Envoy Angelina Jolie for their devotion to this cause and for convening this historic summit. I also wish to acknowledge the leadership of African Union Chairperson Kusazana Lamina Zuma and an appointment of her African Union Special Envoy on Peace, Women, Peace and Security. I am delighted to join arms with my sister, Binta Dio, who was recently appointed in this room. To all the champions gathered here this morning, I salute your determination to live up to the declaration of commitment to end sexual violence in conflict that your government has signed. I thank you for standing in solidarity with the thousands of survivors of sexual violence in conflicts around the world. The Secretary General's personal and steadfast commitment to the prevention of great human rights violation has ensured that sexual violence in conflict is a top priority for the entire United Nations system, challenging us all to work in unison. I am now honored to deliver the message of the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. I am pleased to send greetings to all participants at this global summit to end sexual violence in conflict. I thank the government of the United Kingdom for hosting. I am encouraged that this gathering brings together officials from different spheres, including the defense and the security sector. It is essential to expand the circle of action. Not long ago, Sexual violence was viewed as a marginal, sad inevitability. Today, thanks to efforts like yours, it is understood to be an urgent problem at the top of the international agenda. Sexual violence in conflict is widespread, yet largely invisible. This deplorable act sent a, sound, a loud message of terror to communities yet they are shrouded in silence. For victims, rape is often a lifelong trauma, yet perpetrators rarely face justice. Those who bear the greatest responsibility for commanding or condoning mass rape are often the least likely to be held accountable. Today's ministerial dialogues are an opportunity to take forward the good ideas shared over the past two days and build support for emerging recommendations at the highest political level. I trust your deliberations will focus on survivors, civil society advocates, and colleagues in the field working fearlessly to report and respond to sexual violence. 
we must also support national governments as they exercise their primary legal and moral responsibility to protect their citizens. I commend the national authorities of Somalia and the Democratic Republic of Congo, two countries where rape in conflict seem intractable. Both are now demonstrating that change is possible. The Democratic Republic of Congo is de developing new legal structures to end impunity for perpetrators. Both the DRC and Somalia have shown commitment at the highest level to end sexual violence in conflict, including by signing joint, signing joint communique with the United Nations. I hope other countries confronted with conflict-related sexual violence will follow these examples. At the regional level, we are closely collaborating with the African Union to implement the recent United Nations African Union Framework of Cooperation to end conflict-related sexual violence in Africa. This summit is an important vehicle to strengthen collective action to end impunity, boost services, improve the global response, ensure women's participation and empowerment, and enhance the role of the military and other security sectors actor, including United Nations peacekeepers, to prevent conflict-related sexual violence. We have the tools, political momentum and clarity of purpose to turn this tide on this crime. As we advance together, the United Nations will continue to provide strategic leadership to rid the world of sexual violence in conflict. Thank you for your engagement and commitment. That ends the message from the United Nations Secretary General. Thank you. Now, as we are coming out, they will know. Doctors will know. The lower, the, 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 the legal people will know. The counselors will know what to do. It's what I just want. People to hear and more people to come out. The people did not get the solution to give to this problem because no one came out and talked about it. Because also of the, the shame and the fear, sometimes also we say we need protection. We are ready to speak out. We are ready to talk about this phenomenal rape. But also there's also dangers are there. And when the survivor does not talk about his own issues, no help will come out. So they can't know what this really, but the, really the pastor is in need of until you talk about your problems. It made me angry to hear a 14-year-old girl telling me how she had been raped. It made me very angry to hear a mother, 28-year-old woman, say how she had been raped and how she had watched her 10-year-old daughter being raped under her eyes. These are awful stories. And what makes me very angry to believe that the world stands by silently while such atrocities continue. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Nobel Laureate, Lema Gabawi. Thank you. So God be the glory for another great day. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Thank you. I would like to recognize my fellow Nobel sisters, Jody Williams, Shireen Ibadi, and Tawaku Kama, for being here as part of the delegation of the international campaign to stop rape and sexual violence. To the survivors who are here to share their stories and interact, I congratulate you for your bravery and strength. I ask you to kindly indulge me as we stand for a moment of silence for every girl, boy, woman, and man that have died as a result of rape and sexual violence. Please stand. Amen. Thank you. To sisters and comrades in the fight for women's rights and social justice, thank you for coming. Thank you for keeping the flame of advocacy alive. 
In February of this year, I found myself in the Democratic Republic of Congo as part of the Nobel Women's Delegation. I was very excited to be in the field because these trips with my sisters are what keeps my adrenaline pumping. But it is also an opportunity, it was an opportunity for me to see my Congolese sisters and listen to stories of resilience and immense strength. From Bunia to Bukavu, the stories were, of this, were the same. Women stepping up, responding to their sisters' need for counseling, humanitarian assistance, solidarity, and a strong sense of sisterhood. This was a testament that women who were abused were no longer willing to allow rape and sexual violence to define who they were. The pain would never stop their power to pursue life. They had a purpose to do things differently. My take from the DRC, which I bring here today, is that if survivors of such horrific crimes are doing things differently to repair their lives, it's time for those of us who have vowed to journey with them to take cue. We must begin to do things differently. Firstly, it is important today that national governments invest in the justice structure at local and national levels. They must improve the capacities of police to investigate at no cost to the victims and their families making provisions for rape kits and other necessities. Secondly, we must be proactive about the issue of sexual violence in peacetime. Sexual violence and rape does not arise solely out of the conditions of war. It is directly related to the violence that exists in women's lives during peacetimes. These acts in peacetime go largely unpunished. Militarization and the presence of weapons legitimize new levels of brutality and impunity. This violence, unfortunately, continues in post-conflict where chaos adds to the many frustrations exacerbated by wars. Thirdly, to imagine that we can stop rape in conflict without stopping wars will be like trying to draw blood without pricking our fingers or cutting. It is impossible. For us to do things differently, like our sisters in conflict zones, we must endeavor to put an end to the militarism that has engulfed our world in ways that are not necessary. Mr. Haig, Ms. Jolie, Auntie Zainab, when history or her stories are being written about people who took stands on rape and sexual violence, you will be included. This is the right step in the right directions. Our sisters in Congo, Syria, Southern Sudan, and other parts have taught us that we can turn and transform our sufferings into a force that builds a secure future for humanity. It is upon each and every one of us in this room to journey with them the right way. Thank you.